Just on that note, um, you guys have just brought up something interesting in terms of you mentioned uh, not just Oatly, but some of these companies like Cargill, Tyson, et cetera, a lot of these conglomerates, especially with how concentrated the animal agriculture industry is. How much of this pressure is coming from, is, is coming externally? Like I, I do remember um, uh, the CEO of Tyson, is it, uh, or Purdue, who was saying, we're in the chicken, we're in the protein business, we're not in the chicken business. And case-free commitments um, without companies like Costco, I know a lot of vegans have trouble accepting that, you know, incrementalism, which it, it doesn't sit well with any of us. We want to just, a lot of people who aren't vegan want to see the end of factory farming. But when you make these companies make these changes uh, and they, or they, you know, commit to doing them on their own, then uh, animal welfare improves, but it also comes at a higher cost and their higher prices. At some point, you know, people might stop buying eggs, you know, the price for it to go up as new entrants come in. So the question here though is, how much of that corporate culture is changing uh, internally, like just from their own decisions, which I know Costco was um, petitioned pretty hard. There was a Brad Pitt letter and others, but they didn't make that change until six months later. And interestingly enough, like they don't market on it or advertise on it because I guess it would still draw attention. But is that something where, that where activism really helps or is it like this, is this shift really happening internally at these companies on its own? Did you, Sorry. Uh, that was for you a follow up and then we can go back to okay that. okay great so that's that's a great question and i think the bottom line to talk about bottom lines is that companies are going to change when it's in their interest to change the staving off animal welfare activists and I, i'm not going to say capitulating to their demands i'm not sure it's capitulation per se but when someone says okay fine we'll make a cage-free commitment they're doing this for PR reasons. They're not making cage-free commitments because they think it's going to be better for their bottom line. They know it's going to not be good for their bottom line or else they would have done it before, right? So I don't know that the changes are coming internally, but what I do know is that technologies that are coming up will make producing chicken cheaper, producing beef cheaper, producing whatever they produce cheaper. These major conglomerates do not own the animals. They don't own the farms. They don't actually have an interest in keeping animals in cages, except for that right now, that's the most efficient means of production. And that's why the technology to me are so exciting because when these technologies can reach cost parity for the conglomerates, that's when we're going to see the change. We're not going, I, I'm not going to say we're not going to see it because of activists. Activists raise com consumer awareness. That puts pressure, important pressure on companies to pay attention. They, it puts important pressure on regulators, on politicians to say, we can't ignore this. This is a reputational risk for companies. If investors are saying, we really don't want an animal welfare scandal coming out of here. We don't want pictures of carcasses of livestock floating in rivers by schools. It's, there are lots of different pieces here where consumers matter, where consumer perception matters and activism matters for all of those reasons. I do admire the activist organizations that go and actually take pictures of what's going on in these farms because it's terrible, but it matters, um, be, but it matters because of a matter of perception. But then I shift to the, to the technology side and Rethink X has written a fantastic report where they say that for, they focus on fermentation. They wrote the report a couple of years ago. I think that they might cultivation and fermentation are sort of in a neck and neck race in, in terms of technology. But their point is just that this will end because it's economically unsustainable, meaning it's not in the best interest of the conglomerates to keep contract farmers in place and keeping the vertical farming model in place. So when I educate investors, I talk about the unsustained, the literal unsustainability. We're running out of land, we're running out of water. We can pollute the air. It seems like we're not doing, we can't feel that in the same way, except by droughts and floods and wildfires and crazy storms. And I mean, we feel it, but not as much as we have. Literally, your water costs more. You can't, the farmers can't afford to, to rent the land anymore. Um, it, it, these constraints are, are, are really, really becoming more important. And at the same time, we have technologies coming up saying we need less water, 96% less water, you know, 90% less land for the same product. So I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, though. I think I'm saying there's an, kind of an ecosystem of pressure here, and it's not quite as easy as, as is the change coming from within these corporations or because of pressure, but because of a combination of 
perception, necessity, technology, and it's all at the end of the day, it's going to be about what is the economically most feasible. So yeah, hope that's that uh, no, it's a good, that is, it is a comp, it's not an easy uh, question to answer, I'm sure. And I'm very curious to hear Tim's um, side of this in terms of the, how personal investors and investment might be driving this. But just really quickly, that report you just mentioned, for anybody who's not familiar, is extremely insightful. And it's by Rethink X Priorities. We'll put a link up um, eventually with this uh, video. But one thing that's fascinating for those who are um, interested in animal agriculture, its effects, and food choices and impact, they do call for the end of the beginning of the end of U.S. dairy and livestock um, beef by the it started at the end of this decade, like 2030 to 2035. It's just mind blowing that we could be there. And it's, it's something I think a lot of us vegans don't think about is we're so focused. Many of us go through this militant phase of wanting to, you know, just like let everybody know or at least share some passion. And that seems to be the most common and reasonably uh, understandable place to start. But uh, really, th these changes are going to be absolutely like you know ma magnificent compared to what we can get done on a one-to-one -one scale once they come in on the supply side. So, and we'll, I'll be doing we're doing a, a review of that report as well at plant-based data. So I'm happy you mentioned it. It's it's very influential. Some people question um, the calculations and stuff, but so far it seems um, to hold up. So Tim, on that side, on on that side, given that Kelly provides some institutional perspective, how much? Do you see people driving this in terms of what they're looking for from their investments? Yeah, so, okay. So when it comes to systems change, and let's be clear, like these are complex systems that we're dealing with, right? When we talk about specifically the food system, like my goodness, you know, what a challenging system that needs complete overhaul. Um, there is no one best solution. Uh, we need diversity of tactics. So to me, any argument about should we be doing this versus that is just useless, like do whatever makes your heart sing and like whatever you feel good about, because obviously we need lots of different approaches here. Um, that said, you know, for me, obviously, I am focused on the capital market side of things. And I see so many people that spend so much time and energy and effort looking at their consumption dollars and making sure that their consumption dollars are used in a way that is values aligned but are completely just head in the sand when it comes to their investment dollars. That they just like walked into a bank and bought a mutual fund and they have no idea what's inside and they never teach us this stuff in high school. So they don't even know how, what they're invested in or, or how to find out that information. So to me, it's like, this is a really important step for people who are all, have already taken steps in their life to be able to uh, create some type of systemic change and wanna take it one step further that this is now a really cool tool in their tool belt. And I don't think it's going to replace, you know, we, we can talk about the big companies and how that there are motions now, different tactics there. Again, there's complete divestment saying not one penny, right? And that, that can be a really good way and that can feel good. Um, debatable about whether that's actually the most effective strategy or not. I think it can be. It impacts something called their cost of capital. So if enough people sell their shares in these companies, it makes it harder for them to raise money, right? Um, uh, in, in the same vein, if you invest in the solutions and more people do that, right? It lowers their cost of capital and makes it easier for those companies to raise money and invest in solutions. That said, there are other tactics, things like shareholder engagement, so using, you know, but you need to own shares in order to be able to vote, right? So this is like, okay, I'm going to purposely like own shares in this company so that I can bring this up at their annual general meeting and like raise a huff, you know, to their executives. And that's another strategy, right? And then there is this idea of ESG, environmental social governance investing. And this is where I think, you know, really the, the, the investment community is having an impact on those internal mechanisms. Because now what we're doing is we're starting to measure their environmental impacts, their social impacts, their governance factors. And that, you know, I think that can be a really, really strong gateway that once investors start asking those questions, it requires a response from the companies. They kind of can't ignore it in the way that they often like to ignore, you know, the activists banging at the gate. But it's the activists banging at the gate 
that brings up those conversations in the boardroom. And it's the investors who are either divesting or using shareholder engagement to push that are bringing up and reinforcing those issues in the boardroom. And then it's the people working there who do need to have the mental awareness to say, okay, let's imagine a better future. So to me, it's like, it's we need all these things working together Right. And that for me on the investment side, it really comes down to a personal preference. Like, can you stomach owning those companies? And, and that certainly like without a doubt for people to take the first step that if you just like own mutual funds at the bank, you know, frankly, you're getting ripped off and you're investing in things that you don't want to be investing in by taking control of that very easily, you can at least be using your shares to push the company in the right direction. And then you can even take it a step further and say, I don't want to own shares in that company at all, right? That's really up to you. That's a personal choice there. But to me, it's just really cool because once you get your investments aligned, it is a little bit of a set it and forget it thing. It's not like you have to keep going to the grocery store and keep buying the same thing week after week after week. No, like if you use these sustainable investment approaches, you really only have to make the change once. And then, you know, you're going to be having that sort of uh, 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 the, that, that impact, that, that change action happening, you know, while you nap, while you're sleeping, while you're going about your day, it's not something you have to do, you know, every day or every week or every year, you know, it really is, um, uh, I think, a, a really effective way of aligning your money with your values. That's excellent. And I want to get to a couple of questions that are coming here, but just a really quick follow up there, Tim, is for most people who aren't familiar or new to investing, et cetera, or haven't owned many shares before, is this common for people to try and push for that change? Like it reminds me of what Kelly was just saying in terms of the institutional right. side, but. So you don't want to like, it's rare that people will like buy shares and show up at the AGM. I have had a couple clients that like live in the city where the company like has their headquarters and they're like, Tim, I'm going to show up to the meeting. Like, let's see how this works. That's where nobody expects that. Instead, what most people ought to be doing is buying funds. So mutual funds or my preference are these ETFs exchange traded funds. And they're going to have these things called proxy voting guidelines meaning that they're going to, by default, if you own shares in that ETF, they're going to be voting your shares for these motions that are pushing the company in a sustainable direction. So again, it's not an active thing that you have to do, that you have to like fill out the form and vote every single time. It's just more like switch your funds that instead of buying just like the crappy, you know, bank branded expensive fund, buy the one that is socially responsible or sustainable or vegan, if you know, that's your choice. And that often, you know, they have it by default that your shares are just going to get voted in a better direction. Fair enough. Okay. And so staying at the level of people wanting to like entry level type um, discussion here, one of the questions that came in is if you earn a very average salary, how much can you even begin to invest? How much money do you need to be able to put up front and what kind of return can you expect? And I assume this question is probably fixated in the ESG area. Sure. I'm happy to address that because this is, you know, and it is often a Canadian thing, right? That, that we've got these uh, tax shelters here and, and things there. So, you know, it's, it's, everyone's going to be different here. Everyone's going to have their own budget. Everyone pays a different rent, has different food costs. Some people have daycare, some people like everyone is different. So really what you want to do is like, start by like, you know, creating a budget. I know it's really boring, but like, you know, you got to measure this stuff and that hopefully you do have enough money left over at the end of the month. And if you do, your first step is to build up an emergency fund, right? You don't want to start investing it right away. You want to start by building up anywhere from three months to six months expenses, just in case, you know, life happens and you need that money. Like you want to have that buffer and you should not be taking any risk with that. That should be like in a high interest savings account, keep it in cash, keep it liquid and available. Once you have your emergency fund, and again, I'm assuming all your debt is paid off here, right? That that's when you can start to invest and put money aside. And I mean, now what's really cool is that the technology has made it so much easier that for DIY investors, you know, you can really start with uh, uh, as little as a thousand dollars to open up an account, right? And if you have a thousand dollars that you can put aside above and beyond your emergency fund, you can get started. And then you can put in like 20 bucks a week, you know, 10 bucks a week, whatever you want. Um, you know, when I was teaching college uh, 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 students economics, I kind of did the math for them. If they didn't buy lunch at the cafeteria, if they packed their lunch and saved $10 a day, you know, how that would compound and grow over time, right? It's incredible. So really for a lot of people, it's just kind of getting over the hump of like figuring out the system that it really doesn't matter how much you're starting with. It matters how soon you start. 
And then from there, you know, in terms of a reasonable rate of return, it's very, very challenging question for us. And again, it comes down to this sort of doing less evil versus doing more good. If we just use like standard benchmarks for like a balanced portfolio, it's really gonna depend on how much risk you take. So with your pie chart, it's sort of stocks versus bonds. If you have more stocks, you can higher expected return, but higher risk. If you have more bonds, right, lower risk, but lower expected return. Um, but for a traditional, like we talk about a 60-40 portfolio, so 60% stocks, 40% bonds, you know, right now, the financial planning standards, you know, we assume a very conservative amount, probably about 6.5% per year. Historically, it's been higher than that, but because it's been higher than that, they keep kind of revising their <laughs> targets down to make us, you know, sort of lowball it a little bit. And again, that's going to be before fees. So a big thing people need to understand is that if you walk into the bank and you just get sold mutual funds, you're going to be paying fees over 2%. So from 6.5%, that gets reduced down to 4.5% right away, right? Just because the bankers get their cut. Whereas if you can learn how to do it yourself using ETFs, it'd be really simple to set up a DIY portfolio for like half a percent per year. So from six and a half percent down to 6%. Like I said, you know, all my model portfolios have done better than that over the last, you know, five to 10 years. But you got to understand the history that the last five to 10 years, like last 10 years since the 2008 crash, like have been incredible in the stock market. The last, like since COVID, you know, since the March lows of last year, the stock market has been incredible. So, you know, obviously we've earned more than that, but I don't expect this to continue. And so, you know, I think somewhere in that range of six to seven, maybe 8% if you're taking a little bit more risk, um, you know, and then from there, it's really going to depend on your asset mix and the types of investments that you're going to make. Excellent. And this is probably a very good time for us to plug the fact that you have an online course now, do you not? For Yeah. DIY. So I just launched this, you know, really it was so hard for so long. The only way I could get people through the process was one-on-one -on -one, because it was tricky and people have all these barriers, but now with the financial technology being as easy as it is, I decided, okay, it's now simple enough that we could do it as an online course. Um, so people can take my online course, um, and, and basically learn how to set up a sustainable investment portfolio, sort of build your pie chart and then set up your accounts and actually put that money to work. So it's a really exciting time for me. I'm hoping that this go that's going to make it even more accessible, especially for people who are just getting started. Amazing. I have uh, some couple of quick follow-up questions for you there, but I want to get to Kelly as well here on the, you mentioned talking about not just, it's interesting, you're talking about investing in funds, uh, not going through a bank and in DIY being as um, convenient now as it is and powerful as it is and makes more sense. Kelly, when you were last at Poof, we talked about divestment and this is a really big strategy, right? And ESG is basically all ethical investment is, um, I guess it gets confused with boycotts a little bit because we talked about it with Oatly, but some people argue, impact investors argue that it has no clear real world impact. Um, and I know one thing that's been brought up in the States a lot is uh, getting your money out of banks. Like if you want to have um, a lot more values aligned investment, a lot of big banks put nine or ten dollars into you know fossil fuels or other um, they invest, you know, just turn around, put that money back to you, some things that you wouldn't necessarily approve of. So with where you're at now being capital, how big a role do you see divestment playing? And and that is that different than boycotts? Like how should how do you see divestment in terms of this uh, strategy and ethical investment? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And there is a lot of debate around whether divestment is a good strategy for people who want to affect change. Now, to Tim's point, divestment can increase companies' cost of capital and make it more difficult for them to, to, to get credit to grow their businesses the way that they are that they like to, right? So it can have an impact. This said, it's difficult to achieve that. Um, I think, look at the fossil fuel, divestment movement for a moment. It started in 2011. I think as of 2019 or 2018 or 2019, Shell finally said that the divestment movement could have a material impact on their financial performance. It took a while and the fossil fuel divestment movement is pretty well known. Um, in my personal opinion, the best effect of a divestment movement is popularizing the knowledge of what these companies are doing. So I don't really look at divestment campaigns as um, an attack on 
company's ability to operate. I actually agree that's not the most effective strategy. What it is effective at, however, is raising awareness. And I would say that, again, this is my opinion, and I know we're speaking among people who are sympathetic to the cause and, and who can say, how can people not know, but people still don't know. I, I know I engage with venture capital, private equity, even global asset managers every day. They have no idea. Um, and I'm actually working on a book right now that's the ESG and other material risks of investment in, of investments in animal agriculture saying if you're an average for, forget investment for just a moment, but if you are an ESG focused investor, which almost everyone in the EU is now required to be. And I know in ESG in the States, we're well behind and people are trying to put the brakes on this and penalize pension fund managers who want to incorporate ESG and trying to block that. But it's coming, whether the, you know, the Department of Labor in the US wants it or not, it's coming. And it's coming for good reason. And this is because of the climate change emergency. That's why it's coming. But if you are, if you are serious about ESG, there's no way you can't be looking at these companies and thinking that they're risky investments. Yes, they have negative environmental impact, but if you take ESG seriously, and if you think these are quantifiable material impacts, then you should be looking at animal agriculture. In fact, whether you invest in animal agriculture or not, because, because animal agriculture's impacts are going to affect the global economy. Take pandemics, for example. That's like the, the leading source of pandemics, right? So to return to your question, divestment, is it a good strategy? I think it's a press grabbing strategy. And to the extent that it can educate Consumers, investors, retail investors that may take Tim's course and think, I'm not going to go to a bank and put my money in passive investments. I'm going to pay too much on that just to invest in companies that are doing things that don't align with my values. Great. I'm glad the divestment press reaches them. Um, and for people who aren't in the markets, I know consumer dollars can matter only so much, but for people who can only vote with their dollars or can only invest in, in the products that they purchase, it matters for them too. Um, so again, we at, at Pivot, we were focused on divestment, Pivot still is focused on divestment as a means of educating the, the, the broader public. The other examples that you, that you shared, Tim, about shareholder engagement, about proxy voting, these things matter too, right? We just saw board members removed from Exxon's board. This, this kind of stuff matters, um, shareholder engagement on every level. So I certainly, um, I, I agree with, with that. And to whatever extent one can support shareholder engagement efforts at companies that are doing things that they don't want them to do, et cetera, even if they don't hold enough shares, um, I certainly recommend, recommend doing that. So I hope that answers your question.